Our New Testament reading today is from the book of Mark, chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, and I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. As he was leaving the temple that day, one of his disciples said, Teacher, what beautiful buildings these are. Look at the decorated stonework on the walls. Jesus replied, Yes, look, for not one stone will be left upon another except as ruins. And as he sat on the slopes of the Mount of Olives across the valley from Jerusalem, Peter, James, John, and Andrew got alone with him and asked him, just when all, is all of this going to happen to the temple? Will there be some warning ahead of time? So Jesus launched into an extended reply. Do not let anyone mislead you, he said, for many will come declaring themselves to be your Messiah and will lead you astray. And wars will break out near and far, but this is not the signal of the end time. For nations and kingdoms will proclaim war against each other, and there will be earthquakes in many lands and famines. These herald only the early stages of the anguish ahead. This is the word of God for all of God's people. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Everything in the world has the ending. <clears throat> During this week, we, uh, we have seen so many, so many people have lost their lives to vicious terrorist attack and also to unexpected accidents and also to many, many natural causes. Everything in this world has the ending. Not only human lives, but also even great nations have their beginning and the ending. In today's text, the disciples of Jesus saw the great temple and they were amazed by the size and the quality of the temple. And they said, look, teacher, what massive stones and what magnificent buildings. And Jesus said to them calmly, do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. All will be thrown down. And it really happened in the history in 70, 80, the Romans destroyed the Jerusalem temple, and it was the third temple. The first one was built by the King Solomon, and the second one built by Ezra and Nehemiah. And this magnificent third temple was built by the King Herod, and that was the last one. After that, the Jews did not rebuild the temples anymore. So it was the ending of the era of the temple. You know, every ending is so painful. When the era of the temple was over, the Israelites experienced great suffering as a nation and as a pe people. They went through great trauma of massive genocide by the Romans. And they had gone through wars and exiles and they had suffered from famine and depression. So Jesus warned that the end time of the world would be much more painful than those experiences. He also warned against cheap messages of hope and joy. People, some people would come and claim that they are the Messiah, and many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive 
many, Jesus said. They just said things will better next year. However, the reality is cruel. Jesus said that we would hear of wars and rumors of wars. But do not be alarmed, he said. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. This was not the world that uh, we would have wanted. And I'm sure that it was not the world that Jesus would have wanted. This world was broken, dangerous, and ugly, and so horrible. But Jesus, our Lord, the Son of God, did not attempt to destroy it. So to create a totally different world with one, one clap with the power of God, magically. Instead of destroying it, he wanted to save it. So what, what did he do? He embraced the world as it was. When you see this um, insert today uh, here, I included the serenity prayer by Reverend Dr. Reinhold Niebuhr. It was not uh, written in 1926. It was written about 1934, something like that. We usually see only the, the top, two top uh, uh, paragraphs. But the whole thing uh, was so wonderful, so I wanted to share this with you. Here, um, here he included the one, two, three, four. The fourth one, um, he said, taking as Christ, Christ did, he did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have, would have it. This one really hit me. This does not mean that we should give up on this sinful world. He or Christ meant that we must embrace this sinful world as it is. Otherwise, we would just give up or try to destroy everything in order to create a new world as we would have it. That had happened in the history. Hitler tried, Communist Party tried. They destroyed the existence of the world to create new one as they have wanted. That was not the way Jesus showed. He showed the way of true love. And true love does not give up or destroy the world as it is, as given to us or the family as given to us, or the neighbor as given to us. We don't have much choices, many choices in selecting our families, right? It's given. And the neighbors, even neighbors, it's given. You cannot really select. The very, we have limited choices. The true love would embrace would embrace our family, community, this sinful world as it is. 
Christ did it, and he wanted us to do the same. And when we embrace them as they are, we will see a new beginning at the end, sometime later, after many labors, many tears, and many, many sufferings. So that is the promise of God. When we embrace our community as it is, this world as it is, not trying to destroy and create a new things by our power, then God is going to give us new beginning. You know, even though the ending process is so painful, Jesus said it is the birth pains. The verse 8, it says, Jesus said, these are the beginning of birth pains. Well, gentlemen, what do you know about birth pains? <laughs> We women know some about that. It's, it is truly painful. Well, my first child was supposed to be born on August 15th, which was the Korean Independence Day. And I knew that he wanted to be so independent. <laughs> but I felt my birth pain, the birth, birth pain three days before the due date, and it was Sunday, so I could not go to church. The pain uh, had come uh, already. Um, it was like a five minutes contraction pain, so it's like right before. So according to the book, How to Deliver a Baby, <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to have baby you know, on Sunday you know, because I had this five minutes, you know, very short period of time uh, contraction all day. But it took three days. <laughs> Can you believe it? The, the book was a lie. I couldn't, I should have not listened to the book. So for those three days, my husband could not sleep at all. On the third day, he just fainted. <laughs> and he fell asleep like um, for three minutes. And then he had to wake up because the rear delivery had begun. <laughs> so I give him some credit uh, in sharing my birth pain like that. But birth pain is always worth to have it, right? At the end, what a joy to embrace this little life, little baby in our arms. And that was a, such a big, great joy. You know, Jesus described that the pain in the, in the end of time would be like this birth pain. That's his analogy. So after this pain, a new baby, new life is born. After this long night, a new morning comes. And after a cold winter, a hopeful spring comes. And that's what God promised. So after the destruction of the temple, Jesus opened a new era of the cross. Jesus gave himself as the eternal sacrifice on the cross. And thus, we do not need any more temples. Now, we are the temple where the Holy Spirit resides. Uh, St. Paul said, do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have received from God. The new era of the Holy Spirit brings the life of hope, always, everywhere, 
in spite of many negative, painful things that we see with our eyes. We have heard the news of cancers, arthritis, Alzheimer's, blood clots, paralysis. We see wrinkles and walkers and wheelchairs. These are the signs of aging and physical weaknesses. However, it is not the end yet. And many people will come to us and suggest to try uh, new ways to prevent aging, uh, young skin and stuff. However, we cannot reverse the process. And actually, we do not want to reverse it because bodily aging is a natural process. It is a painful one, but we do not belong to the era of building physical bodies anymore. We have already entered into the new era of building spiritual bodies with the power and the communion of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul proclaimed, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So with the help of the Spirit, we are daily renewed and filled with hope and dreams. Therefore, in this end time, what do we do as disciples of Jesus Christ? Dreaming dreams and working toward those dreams of God and Christ the kingdom. And thus, we will faithfully keep making disciples of Jesus Christ with our lives left. We will not attempt to change the divine process of renewal of our new universe or of our bodies. We will accept them as God's providence. We will, however, continuously work for the transformation of the world as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. So I asked uh, Mel Strong to come forward to share uh, his um, ministry as a hospice volunteer. He's been doing this uh, for years, and his ministry is so beautiful, so I wanted to uh, share that with you. Please come forward. Thank you. Well, I've been a hospice volunteer for four or five years now. For those of you who don't know about hospice, this is funded by Medicare and provides palliative care for those who are terminally ill and diagnosed with having less than six months to live. It is a free service. There's no charge for your drugs or other medical supplies or equipment. I volunteer with Hospice of the East Bay. And I want to thank Mr. Jeff Schultz. He's the guy that introduced me to Hospice of the East Bay. So I thank you, Jeff. I don't know if I ever did thank you before, but I thank you now, better late than Hospice Tree of Lights is December 6th. Yeah, we'll be there. We'll be there. <laughs> I believe Hospice of the East Bay is the oldest hospice in the, in the East Bay. It is a nonprofit. I usually have one or two clients. If you're willing to drive to Concord or Walnut Creek, you could be as busy as you would want to be. But I restrict my volunteering to Pittsburgh, Antioch, the, the East, East Bay here. Once you've gone through the training to be a hospice volunteer, the opportunities for service are posted weekly via email. You look over the postings, and if there are any you would like to respond to, you call the volunteer department, and if that posting is still available, it's yours. There are many different types of opportunities for service. Caregiving relief is one. Anyone who has had the experience of caring for a loved one who is dying 
knows how demanding it is, and you need time for other responsibilities and yourself. Friendly visitor is another one. Being there for the patient, listening as they tell their story so they know someone cares. The key word there is listening. Listening as they tell their stories so they know that someone cares. Transportation, doctor's visits, shopping, reading to someone. I have a lady in a nursing home that I am reading the Bible to now. She was active in her church her whole life, and she enjoys having someone read the Bible to her. The other client I have is a gentleman dying of lung cancer. He lives alone, was never married, has no children, and has no relatives in the area. They requested someone prepare meals for him. I volunteered for the assignment and asked my wife if she would help me. My wife doesn't like social gatherings, small groups, discussion groups. No, you're not going to find her there. She loves crafts, sewing, making clothes for our great-granddaughter, quilting, knitting, crocheting, and handwork like that. She volunteered to help me. We deliver two meals on Monday, two meals on Wednesday, three meals on Friday. They are in Tupperware so they can be kept in the refrigerator. They don't require a freezer. We also provide healthy snacks and goodies. Joe, that's not really his name, but Joe loves my wife's cooking. He takes pictures of her meals and sends them to his friends. <laughs> Some have responded by saying, man, I wish I had a deal like that. My wife has taken great pride in preparing delicious home-cooked meals for Joe. And by the way, I'm eating better too. <laughs> she has told me several times how she, how she enjoys several times how good it is to be doing something for somebody else. Joe was raised in Dallas, Texas. He says my wife cooking is just like the way he remembers his mother and grandmother to cook. I imagine that is true. My wife was raised in a small town in Missouri. He was talking with his cousin who lives in Texas, he was telling her about the meals my wife prepares for him and how they are like the ones he remembers growing up. She asked him, has she sent you any chicken fried steak? Oh, he said, no, she hasn't. That evening when he opened his Tupperware dish to see what he was having for dinner, chicken fried steak. <laughs> so he took a picture of it and sent it to his cousin. We've been providing meals for Joe now for over two months. Hospice has been their most rewarding thing I have ever been involved with. If you are thinking of exploring the opportunities of the hospice volunteer, I would suggest you go to you Google Hospice of East Bay. Their website will tell you all about themselves and what hospice does. And it has a link where you can become a hospice volunteer. There are many other types of volunteer services within the hospice of the East Bay, rather than just the ones I've talked about here. So if you're interested, I would suggest you just Google Hospice of the East Bay, check their link to their volunteer website, and check it out, because there's many other ways you can serve Hospice of the East Bay. So I'll be in the fellowship hall afterwards, and if anyone would like to talk to me about it, I'd love to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.